have heard the word ecosystem. It's a good show of hands, so it should sound pretty familiar to us since we learned about them in school, but do we really understand what they are and how they affect us? I like to think about an ecosystem as a community of organisms working together to keep it healthy and in balance. And Naples is a great example of a thriving ecosystem. There are a large variety of different plants and animals coexisting, whether that be birds, alligators, Florida panthers, live oak, and orchids. And there are ecosystems all across the world. And some of the animals we are going to see today help support their ecosystems in their own individual ways. And I'm even going to show you guys how you can help these animals out in the wild and understand why they are so important to keep around. So I hope you guys leave here today understanding the important role you and the animals play in the ecosystem. So some animals play a really important role in their environment, and they're even called ecosystem engineers. And Otis is a great example of what that means. So Otis is about to be coming out, and he's probably one of my favorite animals that's coming out on stage. And this is Otis, and Otis is our six-banded armadillo. So he looks pretty similar to the nine-banded armadillos that are found right here in the United States, but six-banded armadillos are located in South America, commonly living in savannas, forests, and drier areas. But despite having such a large amount of area to live in, the most common place you're going to find the six-banded armadillo is actually on the side of the road. And in Brazil, the six-banded armadillo is the number one animal involved in wildlife collisions on roadways. And while that's really upsetting to hear, just by watching Otis here on stage, you guys are actually helping the Naples Zoo support us research project called Anteaters and Highways. And while that name implies that they only work just with anteaters, their work actually helps a multitude of different animals, including the six-banded armadillos. So by analyzing data they collected from roadside collision surveys, they were able to find the areas where the animals were most impacted. This has allowed them to start creating wildlife collision corridors in certain states of Brazil. And this means that any new paved road will have multiple mitigation measures, like underpasses and fences. And we actually have similar systems set up place right in the United States. And we're about to see a really good example of that. So this is actually an underpass that's in Florida. And as you can see, there's a lot of different animal species utilizing these underpasses, whether that be bobcats, cougars, bears, and a lot of different animals do a great job of utilizing them, which really helps maintain and minimize a lot of wildlife collisions that could potentially happen if these weren't around. So keeping animal populations healthy is really important, but extremely important for our six-banded armadillo, the ecosystem engineer. So armadillos actually in the wild would create things called burrows, and they use their really strong claws to do that. And this actually is a really great video demonstration of this is actually Otis, and he is using his enrichment to create these burrows, or to create, or dig in these, uh, his enrichment. And he's using those really strong burrow, using those really strong claws, and he's getting some food at the bottom of that donut. But armadillos can use those really strong claws in the same way in the wild. So armadillo burrows actually in the wild can be around seven inches wide and almost 15 feet deep. And they can be used by a lot of different armadillo species, like this borer and all of these different animals that can really utilize these burrows. And these burrows are great for them because they have a constant temperature 365 days a year and the hot, humid summers and cold winter nights that occur in South America. But not only are these burrows great for other animals like this tamandua, but they're also amazing for the soil. By creating these burrows, they naturally aerate the soil, allowing for new ground turnover and just creating a healthier ecosystem and all. So like all animals, armadillos rely on a really healthy ecosystem to provide them with food. And armadillos are omnivores, so they can eat plants, fruits, and even meats, including snakes, amphibians, and things like that. But like I mentioned, armadillos do live in forests, and they're forests all across the world. And these forests provide a lot of different foods for a lot of different animal species. And sometimes the food that the forests provide can even turn into more forest. And animals like wags use their diet to help keep their environment growing. This is wags, and wags is our African gray parrot. So African gray parrots are found in the Western and Central African rainforest ecosystems. And they're gonna be living in trees like here in this picture. And that's a great example of where they're gonna be at. 
And when they're sitting in these treetops, they're going to be using their beak as a third foot to help them climb from tree branch to tree branch, which is really great for them so they don't have to use unnecessary energy from flying from tree to tree. But in the wild, African gray parrots can be seen eating a lot of different food items like the oil palm nut, berries of the cola plant, and also a wide variety of insects, nuts, bugs, seeds, also flowers and bark. But here on stage, Wax is eating a peanut. As you can see, he's a pretty messy eater, dropping about half of his food on the ground. And this is not just unique for him, but for all parrot species, which drop about 50% of their food on the ground naturally. And this is actually a really great thing that helps their environment around them. So by dropping all these different nuts and seeds, they're naturally helping their ecosystem forest floor grow. And not only are they just dropping these nuts and seeds, but parrots can be seen as plant pollinators and plant protectors just by living their everyday lives. So we just learned some great ways that parrots naturally help their ecosystems, but there are a few ways that we can help them out in return. So parrots are found all across the world, such as Central America, South America, and Africa. And there is a product that's grown in all of those different regions. And some of us actually consume it on a daily basis. And do we have any guesses on what that might be? Any guesses? Well, it's coffee. So how many coffee drinkers do I have out here today? I definitely drink it to survive my mornings. So I totally feel you. But what I'm about to show you is what a traditional coffee plant looks like. And this is a traditional coffee field. As you can see, all of those trees are cut down in that area, only leaving for coffee bushes to be left instead. And this really affects the different birds and animals that rely on those habitats for, the, that, for those trees that provide them for them. But coffee bushes actually really prefer to stay in shaded areas, but they have to be sprayed with harsh chemicals like fertilizers and pesticides because they have to have such a fast production time. And we could potentially be drinking those, but it wouldn't make sense for me to ask for you to stop drinking your daily cup of joe, but we do have other options. This is what bird-friendly coffee looks like. So as you can see, there's a lot of different trees in this area creating a great shaded environment for these coffee bushes, as well as creating a lot of different natural habitats for these birds to provide in, and also for animals to live in as well. And by drinking bird-friendly coffee, not only are you getting a great organic coffee for yourself, but you're also helping really keep all of these different animals' habitats intact and create a great ecosystem for them. And you can actually find bird-friendly coffee uh, at grocery stores as well as online. You can purchase it and bring it right to your home. And you can try some right here at Cafe Roar, and I promise it's very good. And it is a win-win situation allowing for you to have your delicious coffee and to have the birds and other animals keep their habitat. But I do understand if we love the coffee that we're already drinking, but it is always nice to have options. So using our buying power is a great way to help support animals and their environment. But sometimes animals that are in, in our right backyard do need a little bit more understanding. But sadly, some animals do get a bad reputation. So it's, it's hard to see past them, but once we do, we can learn how much they help us out and how much we want to help them in return. So our next animal we're coming out, you guys are going to guess what she is right when she comes out. And this is Lily. And what is Lily, everyone? She's a skunk. So striped skunks are found right here in our own ecosystems, but a lot of people wish they weren't because of that really strong spray that they're famous for. But let's talk about that spray and how it's not as bad as we think it is. So in the wild, skunks actually would prefer not to spray you because it takes 10 whole days for them to make more of that spray. And that actually will show a little other def defenses instead of using that spray. So one of their first ones, of course, would be that beautiful black and white coloration that Lily has on her. And that's a really big indicator to stay away. Other things that they would use would be stomping their feet, lifting their tail, and they might even charge you. And if none of those things work, they then of course would have to use that spray of theirs. But how many people here have heard that you should use tomato juice to get out skunk spray? That is actually a myth, so let me explain why. So tomato juice and skunk spray both are really powerful odors, and if you will use it on yourself, it actually tricks your nose into thinking you smell better, but to other people, you still will smell just like a skunk. But there are better solutions if you use hydrogen peroxide, baking soda, and dish detergent, all combined in one, that really helps get that smell out. So now that we don't have to be afraid about getting sprayed by a skunk, we can learn just how great they are for our environment. So like I mentioned earlier, Wags was a great seed dispersal agent, dropping a lot of different nuts and seeds in his environment. 
And that can be the same for Lily here. So we're gonna see a video of a wild skunk foraging in their natural habitat. As you can see, they have that really beautiful thick black and white coat of theirs, and it can actually pick up a lot of different plant seeds. And when they're walking around in their natural environment, they can drop them off into different areas, creating really great plant diversification. Uh -huh. And what do you guys think that skunks are eating in their natural habitat? Any guesses? Bugs. I heard bugs. That's a really good guess. So that is correct. So skunks are not picky eaters. So they're going to eat anything and everything they can come across. So nuts, berries, seeds, and some of their favorites are insects, including spiders, beetles, and cockroaches, which I know none of us are a fan of. So when they're eating all these different animals, sometimes these bugs, like beetles that can spray, actually have their own defense. And some beetles that can spray, when they find them in the wild, they're actually going to roll them on their back, and the beetle will spray all of its defensive spray out. And while the skunk can actually have a really tasty treat, while not getting sprayed by that beetle. So it is kind of ironic that a skunk that likes to spray for itself as a defense doesn't want to get sprayed in return. But skunks provide really, really good pest control. But that's one reason why we really want to keep them around, because they're going to eat a lot of nasty things like cockroaches and spiders and beetles and things that we don't want in our house ourselves. And I don't know about you, but I would much rather have a skunk in my backyard than a cockroach in my cabinet. So everybody, are now y'all a little bit more fans of skunks living in your backyard? Do I have any change anyone's minds today? I hope so. I really love Lily. She's one of my favorites. But skunks do a really good job of doing great natural pest control in their environment. And they also can really help us out overall, keeping a really healthy food chain in their ecosystem. So a lot of animals do that in certain ways. And Lily does it by just foraging in her natural habitat, which is a great way for her to do things. And some animals can fall actually right in the middle of the food chain, and they really help us keep balance in our own ecosystems. And the next animal we're about to bring out, actually you guys probably might not like, but it's okay, we're gonna learn just how great they are for us today. They have a lot of misunderstandings. But we're about to bring out Snake, and Snake is our ball python. So this is actually Snake's name is Snake. I know we're super creative here at the zoo, <laughs> but Snake is actually found in Africa. So we're not gonna have the specific species right here in the United States, but we do have a lot of other native species, especially here in Florida and all across the United States. So snakes have a lot of different misconceptions about them. And we're gonna talk about a few of them today and understand why they're really, really important to keep around to help us keeping us healthy and also just keeping our ecosystem in balance. So one of the first misconceptions that people think about snakes is that they're super slimy which is actually not the case. So snake scales actually have, are made up of keratin, which is the same thing that your fingernails are made of. So hopefully you guys don't have slimy fingernails. If you do, I would definitely get that checked out, but that's actually what they're made of as well. So they're super smooth, not slimy. And another misconception that people will have about snakes is that they're always looking at you and they want to eat you because they're never blinking their eyes. But in fact, they have no eyelids, so they cannot blink. So they always have a continual fixed stare. Another misconception that people will think about snakes is that when they're sticking their tongue at you, they also want to eat you, which is in fact not true. They're actually looking for their other prey items, which are not humans because they do think of us as a predator. So they're gonna be sticking their, their tongue out and they actually have this really cool organ called the Jacobson's organ. So their snake's tongues are actually split in two different directions, allowing them to sense in two different ways. So I just talked about them eating their prey, uh, prey items, and what's a huge prey item that snakes are eating in the wild? Mice. Mice, yes. So mice, rodents, rats, things like that. They're gonna eat a lot of those in the wild. And rodents and mice can actually cause a lot of problems for not only us, but our ecosystems in general. So rodents can carry a lot of different diseases, like hantavirus, as well as the black plague, which none of us want around. And they can also do a lot of different damage to our crops. And when a mice will find different types of crop fields, like cornfields, they'll actually do a lot of different damage. And in Nebraska, it was seen they can do $20 million of damage for grocery stores because they're destroying a lot of those crops. And that could translate into us having higher grocery store bills in general. So they do an amazing job by a lot of different ways that they can eat these rodents. And one of them would be their sleek size. So 
Rodents are usually going to be found in smaller areas like feed barns and crop barns, and they're going to be in those small holes. And snakes can actually really utilize that size of theirs to get into those smaller holes and objects. And, bird, and other animals like birds, like hawks and cats, can't utilize those areas. So they're really able to wipe out some baby species of rodents, and that's a great job that they can do. And another way that they can really utilize their body parts is subspecies, like the ball python, like how snake is, they actually have things called heat pits. So these are going to be on the sides of their face, and they can use infrared radiation to actually find their prey items. So here's a really great example of that. So in this picture, it's actually a picture of a mouse. I'm sure you guys can't see it, but this is at night. And this is our regular view of who we'd see that mouse at night. But this is how it shows up with the snake. So you can see they see it really well with that infrared radiation. So we just found some amazing ways that snakes can really help us out. And we really want to keep them around because not only it is illegal to kill snakes, so we really want to keep them around to help create a really great balance for our ecosystem. So snake is really great and we really want to keep them around to help them out. But there are other animals that really do need our help in other instances. And sometimes it is to solely just help them cross the road. And our next animal that's coming out sometimes takes 20 minutes to do a full lap around stage, but I promise you, he is worth it. I think he's stuck at the wall today, but it's okay. We're gonna be bringing out Stuart, and Stuart is our leopard tortoise. So leopard tortoises are found in Africa, and while we may not have them right here in Florida or the United States, we do have a lot of different turtle and tortoise species. So leopard tortoises in Africa are actually considered a keystone species. And this is because they're gonna eat a lot of different grasses and plant materials. And when they're taking out those grasses and plant materials, they're actually creating new area for new plants to create and grow in those areas that they've cleared out. They do a really great job of doing that. So I'm sure you see on Stuart, he has a really nice high domed shell. And that's a great defense from other predators in the wild. So that shell is actually strong enough to withstand the bite of a lion. Super impressive. And so he can actually just tuck in his arms, his tail, and his head, all in that shell. And in the wild, they would just be able to walk away from that predator because the lion would, of course, not be able to eat him. So they just pop their heads out and legs and tail and just go back onto grazing what they would normally do. So to have such a strong shell, though, they need to eat calcium. And sometimes the way that they can find calcium in the wild can be kind of gross. And do we have any guesses of what they might eat in the wild that keeps that shell super strong? Any guesses? Well, it's hyena poop. I'm sure you guys weren't guessing that. <laughs> so let me explain. So hyenas in the wild, when they're going to be eating their prey, they're going to eat the entirety of their prey. And that includes the bones. So those bones don't digest super well, and we're going to leave behind a calcium packed poo for tortoises like Stuart to graze on in the wild. And we do actually have a hyena right here at the zoo. Her name is Hera. I definitely recommend you guys checking her out later in the day. And once a week, we will take Stuart down to Hera's yard and we'll drop him off so he can have a nice tasty calcium filled treat while hopping out the keepers in return. I'm just kidding, we don't do that. <laughs> but he does get a really nice salad with lots of calcium every single day made by our wonderful commissary team. So like I mentioned, there's a lot of different turtle and tortoise species that live right here in the United States. And there's a lot of different ways that we can help them out. And one of the biggest ways we can help them out is by helping them cross the road. How many people here have helped a turtle or tortoise cross the road? Yay, that's great to hear. Well, if not, it is totally okay. We're gonna learn how to today. So one of the most important things to begin to help a turtle or tortoise is to make sure that you're in a safe area. If there's a lot of high traffic and it's not a safe area for you to help this turtle or tortoise cross, then I would not recommend it. But if you are in a safe area, the second most important thing you need to do is make sure you have that turtle or tortoise by both sides of the shell, like you saw Allie walking around with Stuart. So when you have them by both sides of the shell, you're gonna wanna make sure you're not grabbing them by their tail or their head or their legs, because their tail and their legs can really hurt them, and their head, of course, can hurt them as well, but it also could hurt you, because that is the bitey end. So once you do have them by both sides of the shell, you're gonna wanna make sure you're putting them in the direction they were originally going. So in this video, this is a great example of Stuart walking on stage, and he's going in one direction, and our keeper is going to be turning him all the way in the opposite direction where he wanted to go, and he is going to do the slowest U-turn ever and eventually go back in that same direction that he was wanting to go to before. 
So this is not unique just to Stewart, but for all turtle and tortoise species. They are very determined animals, and they're going to get to go where they're wanting to go, whether that be for food, water, or mating purposes. So in the wild, it's really important that we're going to help them continue on their journey that they wanted to go to originally. So we're finding this turtle or tortoise, and those are some great ways to help, but what are the differences between turtles and tortoises? So I'm sure you saw in Stewart, he has those really big, stumpy legs. And those are great for maneuvering in his regular terrain back in Africa. But turtle species have more webbed feet and clawed toes, which really help them in some certain situations, depending on the species, swim in the water, but also in other areas to stay on land. But those are two huge indications to find out which guys you're helping. But we really want to make sure when we have this turtle or tortoise to put them near a body of water and not in it because tortoises cannot swim. And if we were to put one right in the middle of the water, they would sink like a stone and we do not want that. So those are some really helpful tips that we can learn at helping turtle or tortoises in the future. So Stuart, like every single animal that we brought out here today, is all connected by the circle of life one way or another. And some animals do an amazing job of keeping their ecosystems in balance. And our next animal that we're about to bring out is a top predator from Africa, and you guys are actually helping support this animal right by coming to the Maple Zoo today. So I'm going to have to have everyone stay seated the entire time while he is out here. I think we're all ready to go. So we're going to be bringing out Baku, and Baku is our African serval. African servals are, of course, from Africa, and uh, one of the first things that we notice about Baku is people think that he's a baby cheetah, which in fact, he's an entirely different species and fully grown, and he does get the nickname of the cat of spare parts because of all of those really impressive body parts that he has on him. So he has those super impressive huge ears, spotted coat, and really long legs, and that helps African servals in the wild really help catch their prey. So by using those long legs of theirs, they can actually catch their prey and jump up in the air and catch a bird flying in mid-flight 13 feet in the air. And by using those super nice ears of his, he can actually hear rodents scurrying underground. And by when they're stalking their prey, they actually, their spotted coat really helps them blend into those tall savanna grasses. And those long legs, once they were find a rodent burrow, can help them snatch in and get their prey and have a tasty snack for themselves. African servals actually have a 50% success rate at catching their prey in the wild. And while that doesn't sound super impressive, compared to a pride of lions with only a 20% success rate, these guys can be seen as one of the top predators in Africa. But African servals do an amazing job of keeping their eco ecosystem in balance by eating smaller animals like birds and rodents, but they are being affected by a problem that's happening in Africa. So farmers in Africa are actually poisoning meat because bigger animals like lions and leopards are eating their livestock and killing them. And farmers really rely on this livestock to keep a living and to help maintain and help their family out. And smaller animals like African servals are being affected by this because they're not going to say no to a free meal. But Naples Zoo is actually partnered with an organization called African People and Wildlife. And what they do is create a thing called a living wall. And what this wall is consisted of is native trees and wire fences. And once those wire, those trees grow bigger and thicker and denser, they're actually going to create a visual barrier from these predators. And these walls actually have a 99% success rate at working and really helping lower those retaliatory killings for these predators. And this really helps us out. And you guys are actually just helping this organization out just by coming to the zoo today. So, as I mentioned, we're all connected by our ecosystems one way or another, and we really will learn some important ways that we can help them out, whether that's buying sustainable products at the store, learning some of the misconceptions that we had about some of these animals, or just helping support ACA institutions like the Naples Zoo. And Aviers and Highways and Living Walls are not the organizations that you guys are helping out by coming today. We also help support 25 different organizations all across the world, and with your help, we've helped raise over $2.5 million for efforts. So on behalf of myself and all of the animals that came out today, I would like to thank you guys so much for coming out and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day at the zoo and if you have any questions, please feel free to come down and ask. Thank you guys so much.